Le moins de superficie cultivable par habitant, 0,6 hectares pour la Chine, 0,3 hectares pour l'Inde, réussissent à nourrir leur population de plus d'un milliard d'habitants. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that Africa, though with immense natural resources, is the world's most food insecure region. Around 226 million people, or one out of every five people in Africa, are chronically food insecure. In fact, compared to the rest of the world, while Africa hosts around 15% of the world's population, it is home to close to one third of those affected by hunger in our planet. In the midst of these challenges, however, there is no doubt that agriculture in Africa has also had some success stories. The interventions of the government of Ghana to introduce mechanized farming system and make block farm a reality for small scale farmers has successfully turned the country into an established food basket. In Uganda, the production of fish has dramatically increased by 35% over the last decade, resulting in aquaculture production rising from 285 metric tons in 99 to over 100,000 metric tons nowadays. Egypt's rice yield today stands at 9 metric tons per hectare, which makes it the best rice output performance in the world. Its rice production is expected to reach around 7.5 million tons this year with earnings of about half a billion dollars. Water harvesting in Tanzania has been successfully scaled up in the lowlands where seasonal rainfall can be as much as 600 to 900 millimeters, improving the Majaluba rain fed rice farms. With the help of low-cost individual pump schemes, Nigerian farmers have turned to small-scale irrigation using shallow groundwater recharged by a river and lifting it by shadow or calabash in the dry season to grow vegetables for city dwellers. These successes are still, and sadly, not the average people. We must admit, we have to increase productivity. The majority of African farmers have not benefited from initiatives and programs aimed at improving farming techniques, better farm equipment, seeds, fertilizer, post-harvest technology, agricultural financing, and so on. The question to ask is why it is that minimal level of success has been attained so far. The simple response is that agriculture, the sector which seems to hold one of the key solutions for the continent's transformation, has been long neglected and ill guided. This is reflected by the fact that spending, either public expenditure or official development assistance, has largely been improperly allocated, not addressing fundamental agricultural needs. For example, in 2002, Africa received almost double the amount of ODA to agriculture, or roughly $713 million, of what was given to countries in Eastern and Southeast Asia at about $479 million. This did not, however, translate into greater return for the extra dollar. African countries' expenditure on agriculture has always been, with few exceptions, less than what CADEP estimated target of 10%. History tells us that nations that have succeeded in taking their people out of poverty have done it on the back of an agricultural revolution that involved systematic improvements in production, storage, processing, and use. Increase in agricultural productivity has, from the time of the European Industrial Revolution, contributed immensely to fast-tracking the structural transformation of economies. The effect of agricultural revolution on economies of Brazil, India, and China give an illustration of how the surplus from increased agricultural productivity can fuel industrial growth. 
Africa's agriculture has yet to be used as a true tool for transformation. Africa is within its reach, the capacity, the people, resources and opportunities to lead the way on sustainable development. A truly transformational agricultural sector requires several prerequisites for a coherent policy type. Let me propose a 6R strategy, R like in the letter R. First, we need to re-emphasize, that's the first R, re-emphasize strategies and policies for structural agricultural transformation, taking into account the integrated approach to the economic, social, and environmental dimensions. We need to focus on food, land, water, forest equity, bioenergy resources, urban rural as well as forward and backward linkages between agriculture and other evolving sectors of African economies. This is how we'll make agribusiness a major goal. Second, we, we, need, we must reduce, second R, the vulnerability of millions of African small-scale farmers and consumers to high volatile prices while increasing the resilience to shocks. The misconception of food security as a replacement for poverty reduction must be debunked. Food security should be approached economically and not as a poverty reduction problem. Third, while recognizing Africa's industrialization must be commodity-based, we need to make the case that this is the way to redirect the third R, the, planet, the planet's climate change concerns. Value addition should take place close to where the resources are, thereby reducing large carbon footprints that come with transporting commodities over wide distances for processing. African producers must become price makers and not price takers. We must have a controlling size and can set commodity trends. The proposed deal between cocoa processors Cargill and Archer Daniels Midlands, if it goes through, we'll see the two companies controlling up to 60% of total world trade in cocoa when it is Africa that produces it. Fourth, we have to redefine industrial policy to avoid a blueprint approach where it is a set of predefined interventions. It must instead be embedded in the private sector and must generate processes and procedures that can understand and address the ever-changing needs of industry. This is how we do not copy, but rather learn from the import substitution of Latin America and the export-driven parts of Asia. Ours should be an industrialization that looks into our assets, commodities, and Africa growing market and maximize the needs for the agricultural sector. Fifth, we need to retain the opportunities presented to Africa for green growth. These offer an array of investment opportunities. Africa must see itself as a key player in solving climate change issues rather than a victim. With the largest reservoir of unused arable land, it is the natural leader in a food insufficient world, not being locked to any technology preferences also allows the leapfrogging to a green and clean energy boosted by the best potential in this area in the world. And finally, Africa must remain firm against unfair trade policies and protocols. For example, agricultural subsidies in developed countries continue to distort international commodity markets and lead to dumping, depressing prices and therefore making it unprofitable for African small or the farmers. This year of agricultural and food security provides an opportunity for Africa to take the lead in multilateral negotiations on agriculture with key focus on access to international markets, export competition, such as the use of export subsidies and removing domestic support and subsidies in developed countries. The recent Bali WTO agreement
demonstrated the strength displayed by India with a smaller economy than Africa. The lesson is obvious. The possibilities for growth are endless and Africa is now ready to take the next step. We need to keep the growth up and make it transformative. Africa's agricultural transformation must capitalize on our strengths and resources while taking advantage of new advances in science and leapfrogging obsolete technology. We are near the threshold of what is required to push poverty down. Predictions of 6% growth this year means we need one extra percent to attain the famous seven that will turn our fortunes around. Your Excellencies, the Ghanaians have a saying, the drummer plays better on a full stomach. Recent estimates by ECA and its partners show that African countries tend to lose between 2 to 16 percent GDP due to stunting of children as a result of malnutrition. <coughs> we can address this in a convincing way. Over 15 billion US dollars have been spent in agricultural aid in Africa over the last two decades. 15 billion dollars. And we still have not been able to deal with basic malnutrition. We do not need to say more. To finally realize we need to change tack and speed. We need an African agricultural revolution. To the cattle young herder living in the fields of Kilimanjaro or the Sahel, improved pastures will mean that he will be able to spend more time in school. To the fishmonger of Sierra Leone, an improvement in fish catch through policies that can then patrol it on the high seas mean more income for the family. To the Ethiopian coffee farmer, Pest resistant varieties of coffee will improve the size and quality of harvest. And to the Tanzania maize woman farmer, an improvement in her yield from 2.1 metric tons to 10 metric tons means she has enough money to keep her children in school and to start a small business. ECA is already closely working with the governments of Botswana. Ethiopia, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire and Mauritius to put in place such measures through ECA's proposed commodity-based industrialization plans. Ladies and gentlemen, within this context, the 2014 year of agriculture and food security in Africa will take its relevance and agriculture will become a true running point for change on the continent and beyond as we seek to achieve. In the words of Nelson Mandela, and I quote, an Africa where there will be work, bread, water, and salt. 